Okay, everybody, we're going to keep talking about the phylum mollusca, uh, the mollusks. And uh, there's three different classes, like I told you yesterday. Uh, there's the class bivalvia, gastropoda, and cephalopoda. cephalopoda. Um, now, there's actually more than that. Those, those are just the three that we're actually going to focus on. So the mollusks are divided into seven classes, um, but a few of those are just not very well known, and there's not very many examples of um, and all of these organisms, they're, they're placed in those different classes based off of characteristics of their foot and their shell. Um, so the three classes that we're going to look at um, will be the gastropods, so snails and slugs, the bivalves, uh, clams, oysters, scallops, mussels, and the cephalopods, squid, octopus, chambered nautilus. Um, big diversity in this particular phylum. Um, so these images that you can see here are just a bunch of different ones. Here's the abalone. I showed you one of these in class yesterday. This is the actual living animal making that mother of pearl. Um, these are mussels. This is a clam. This is a scallop. You can see the little eye spots it has. This is a nudibranch, a slug, and something called a conch. And that's a clam. Now, this table, you might need to pause the video on this. Um, you have this table in your notes, and it's important that you fill this out. This is a great summary of um, the differences between the three classes. So first of all, we have examples of what organisms are included in each of these classes, and I've gone over this a few times now. Um, and then if they have an external shell or not, notice that word external. Um, so in the gastropods, most species have one. Um, there's a couple that don't have any, like the slug and the nudibranchs. In the bivalves, they have two. Remember, bi in science, B-I means two. And in the cephalopods, they don't have an external shell except for the chambered nautilus does. Um, and I know a lot of you don't know what a nautilus is, but I will be showing you some clips in class of what that is. Now, um, the gastropods do have an obvious head region, so think of a snail in its head. Um, bivalves don't have an obvious head reason, uh, region, and cephalopods also do. Do they have a radula? Okay. Um, the gastropods do, bivalves do not, they're filter feeders, and cephalopods also do. Types of locomotion, locomotion again means how do they move. Uh, so the gastropods kind of crawl around. The bivalves are mostly sessile. There is actually a type of scallop that swims, but for the most part they're sessile. And cephalopods um, are really good rapid swimmers. Okay, so if you need to pause the video to write all that down, do so. Now, um, as far as the different classes of uh, mollusk, the class gastropoda is the largest and most diverse of those. Um, and it has actually uh, 65,000 different species in that particular class. So the members include the mollusk with one shell, like the snails, the abalones, and the conchs. And the conchs, I showed you one of these in class, and remember the conch shell is what they use in Lord of the Flies, for those of you that read that in English. Uh, so there's a snail, there's an abalone, and there is a conch. Okay. Close. Close. All right, so also uh, members, sorry about that, uh, members of mollusk um, include mollusks with no shells, which are the nudibranchs and the slugs. Uh, so again, this is uh, gastropods. Nudibranchs are beautiful. I'll be showing you some video clips of these guys in class. And slugs. So gastropods move by using their muscular foot. Uh, which you can see the nudibranch here, the slug, the whole ventral surface is its foot, which is located on the ventral side. Now, the gastropods have an open circulatory system. That's different than the annelids that we just got done studying. Those guys had a closed circulatory system. We haven't really talked about an open circulatory system yet. Closed circulatory system is when the blood supply is totally enclosed in veins and arteries. Open, like the name implies, has a component, a part of it, where it's actually open, where 
all the blood goes into a big open cavity and oxygen and nutrients diffuse from it. So instead of blood though, and I say blood just because that you, so that you get the concept, they don't actually have blood like you and I do. They have a fluid that circulates through their body called hemolymph. And hemolymph does not remain enclosed inside a system of blood vessels like in a closed circulatory system. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, so notice the arrows. The arrows are showing you direction of movement. Um, the hemolymph uh, is collected from the lungs or the gills, depending on if we're talking about a gastropod on land or in water, uh, where it is oxygenated. And then it's pumped through the heart. Okay, and so far this isn't a whole lot different than a closed system. And then it's released into spaces, and that spaces, that's our key word there um, that tells us that we're dealing with an open circulatory system. So it's released into spaces within the tissue um, of the body of the organism. So there's our lungs and gills. Notice how the hemolymph goes into this open space. They're not connected with each other, so that's why this is an open system. Okay, then it goes into the heart. Okay, and then the heart releases it into the body cavity where oxygen and nutrients can diffuse to where they need to go. So these fluid-filled spaces right here and here are known as hemocele's or blood cavities. And remember that word cavity just kind of means a room or an opening, and so does seal actually. So uh, this is just a room or a cavity that's full up with um, hemolymph. So from the hemocele, the hemolymph returns uh, using the gills or lungs uh, to the heart. Now snails, um, they're gastropods, and they live on land, obviously. They can also live in freshwater and saltwater, depending on what species we're talking about. Um, they have delicate tentacles on their heads that you see right here, and right here, here, and here. They have eyes that are located on the tips of these tentacles, um, and it helps the snails to locate foods. And so you can see those tiny little eye spots on that image right there. And if it's a snail in the water, we call it aquatic. So aquatic snails get their oxygen and release their carbon dioxide through gills. Uh, land snails do this differently. So land snails, the mantle cavity, and remember the mantle is what helps make that shell. Um, and a cavity is an open room. So the mantle cavity acts as a modified lung and oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged through this very thin membrane that lines the mantle cavity. This membrane has to be kept moist, so snails on land will die if they, if they dry out. So as a result, land snails typically are active at nighttime where there's less sunlight, so less evaporation, and then they remain, remain hidden during the day. And they'll even like close themselves up in the shell and they have a little trap door that kind of closes over their opening there to seal up the moisture in their, um, in their um, body so that they don't dry out, so they don't suffocate to death. Now other gastropods like the slugs, um, these guys, uh, they are terrestrial, so that means they live on land. They look just like a snail without a shell and most of you guys are familiar with slugs. We do have some slugs in Utah. They're pretty small. Uh, if you go to other places like uh, the Pacific Northwest, you get those banana slugs uh, like in Oregon and Washington, and those things are ginormous. Um, so like snails, they do respiration through the lining of their mantle cavity, um, so they have to stay moist. And to avoid dehydration, they hide uh, and moist and shady places during the day. They feed at night. Um, and then they have a special slime gland that secretes a path of mucus in front of the animal. And that helps it to move over the land. Um, and we'll talk about it at a later time. There's actually a type of snake that hunts and eats nothing but slugs. And how it hunts the slugs 
is by following this little mucus path that they make. So they kind of secrete that out in front of them and then slide over the top of that slime. And land snails do this too. Now another type of gastropod, and probably my favorite one, um, or favorite group, is called the nudibranchs. Um, and I'll be showing you a clip about these guys. They're beautiful. They come in a big variety. They're usually very colorful. They have these like finger-like appendages that stick out, and these are like a type of modified gill. It helps them get even more oxygen. So they're commonly called sea slugs. They're marine, so they're in the ocean, and they don't have a shell. Um, to exchange gas, and again, when we're talking gas exchange, we mean the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. The entire body surface of the nudibranch um, is where they do this, is where they do gas exchange. The body surface is covered with these finger-like appendages I was showing you, um, and that increases the surface area for gas exchange, which means that they're better at getting oxygen. Now the foot that's pretty much the whole ventral surface here, can be modified into a wing-like flap that's used for swimming. And this is what I'll show you a clip of after this uh, presentation. And so they actually can swim instead of crawl. Um, and the ones that, ca that can swim we call Spanish dancers, and I'll, I'll explain why when I show you that clip. So some nudibranchs contain chemicals that taste bad or poisonous, and they advertise that with these bright colors. And um, so the nudibranchs are usually brightly colored to serve as a warning to potential predators. Now, the class bivalvia, so that was the class gastropoda. This is class bivalvia. So again, bi means two, and valvia is shell, so they have two shells. Um, and this includes the clams, the oysters, the mussels, and the scallops. Um, they're known as bivalves because their shell is divided into two halves. And then they have like this hinge that you can see right here that connects the two halves. Now, they're able to open and close their shells by using these really strong, powerful abductor muscles, adductor muscles, excuse me, that are attached to the inside surface of the valve. Okay, and so when they say the valve, they mean the shell. Uh, when the adductor muscles contract, the valves, the shells, close. When the adductor muscles relax, the valves open. Now the valve, the shell, it consists of three layers, and all three layers are secreted by the mantle. Um, the thin outer layer protects the shell against acidic conditions in the water. And this ends up being a problem. This is something that all bivalves are struggling with as um, climate change happens. Uh, one of the consequences of climate change is it's increasing the concentration of acid. It's making their oceans more acidic. Um, and those oceans becoming more acidic are affecting how these organisms build their shells. The thick middle layer is composed of calcium carbonate, and that should be a familiar uh, compound to you. It's what corals are made out of and all shells are made out of as well. Um, so it's composed of calcium carbonate, which helps strengthen the shell. And then the smooth inner layer uh, that I was showing you in class yesterday, that really beautiful layer is really smooth, protects the soft body of the animal. Now, clams do move, uh, not much and not well. Uh, most of them are sessile, though, so that means that they don't really move. They attach to one spot. Um, but some species can take their foot and stick it out of their shell into the sand, and then that muscle contracts and pulls the animal down into the sand. So they can move like by burying themselves. And there is one big exception. Like I told you, there's a type of scallop that can swim. Um, the adductor muscles allow the clam to open and close their shells. Now, as far as how do they get food and how do they eat? Um, now, bivalves are filter feeders, so they eat plankton. Um, they're the only mollusk that doesn't have that radula that we talked about yesterday. Um, now, they have beating cilia 
that cause the water to enter the clam through the what we call the in-current siphon. They have two siphons, an in-current and ex-current, and I'll talk about both of those. Um, and they leave, so the water leaves the clam through the X current. So X, think X on the exit outside, so exit, and think in to the inside. Now, as water cycles through the clam, the water is filtered uh, for small organisms and organic debris, mostly plankton. The filtered material becomes trapped on the sticky gills of the clam and then cilia will push the food towards the mouth, okay? Now I'm gonna show you a diagram of what they look like inside so you can see kind of the flow of how the food moves around the animal. So here's that diagram. First, here's the in-current siphon or water would come in. Right above it is the X-current. Okay, here's the cilia that are on the gills. Think of cilia as these little hair-like projections. Now, the palps, which are over here, help to direct the food into the mouth. Okay, so it's kind of a chute that guides that food in. The food enters uh, the stomach once it's in the mouth, so it goes the palps guided in to the mouth and then from the mouth to the stomach. The digestive gland, this kind of yellowish thing following uh, around the stomach here, secretes enzymes uh, into the stomach uh, to help break down the food for digestion. And that's where digestion is completed. Now in the intestine, the digested food is absorbed into the bloodstream. Okay, and the intestines over here. Now waste passes to the anus. And waste along with water is excreted through the X current siphon. Okay. Now, not to gross you out, but I know a lot of you guys like to eat clams and oysters and mussels. I do. Um, and all of this stuff I just described is part of the visceral mass, and that's what we eat. So we're eating all of these parts that I just went over with you. Now, they do have a nervous system. Um, they lack a distinct head. They don't have any specialized sense organs but they do have three pairs of ganglia, these nerve bundles. They have one pair near the mouth, they have one pair in the digestive system, and one pair in the foot. And all of these ganglia, these three pairs of ganglia, are connected by a nerve cord. Um, and those things all act together to form their primitive basic nervous system. Now, sensory cells are located along the edge of the mantle. Uh, these sensory cells send information to those ganglia I just described, um, and this allows the clam to respond to touch or chemicals in the water. Now, this that you're looking at, this picture is not a clam, it's actually a scallop. Um, but all those little dots there, those are actual eye spots, so that is actually some sensory organs that gives them some information. Um, I have a cool video clip that shows uh, one of these scallops that are bioluminescent along this mantle as well. It's really cool. So some bivalves have a row of eyes along the edge of the mantle like I was just pointing out to you. Now, as far as the clam reproductive system, most clams have separate sexes, so separate male and female. And marine clams, so ocean clams, Sperm and eggs are released into the water and fertilization happens externally, kind of like corals when I was talking to, uh, to you about cnidarians in the first quarter. In freshwater clams, eggs are fertilized internally by sperm that enters through the in-current siphon. Um, and then the larvae, those trochophore larvae, are discharged into the water through the X-current siphon. Um, the fertilized egg 
develops into that specialized trochophore larvae. And remember, the only phylums that have that type of larvae are these, the mollusca, and then also annelids. So this larvae is free swimming, but eventually settles to the bottom and develops into an adult. Now let's talk about how they breathe and how they move um, uh, materials around their body. So like gastropods, they also have an open circulatory system and water passes over the gills, exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide in that blood-like substance called hemolymph. Okay, so their circulatory system is just like uh, the gastropods that I previously described to you. Okay, and that's everything for today. I know that was a lot. Um, thanks for being patient. And uh, next class, we're going to talk about the cephalopods.